Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Barnico, and I'm the executive director of the University of Chicago Francis and Rose UN campus here in Hong Kong. Welcome to those of you who are uh, attending, attending this lecture in person this evening and for the audience that we have online. Um, I'm really delighted and excited to have uh, Professor Mark Bradley uh, visit us again here in Hong Kong. Um, the last time I saw Professor Bradley was around the September, October timeframe of 2019. So this is uh, his first trip back to Hong Kong since he was here with a study abroad class um, back in 2019. Um, the program tonight is called When the World Went South, um, and I'm really excited to hear what uh, Professor Bradley has to say about the Global South. Um, but let me first introduce Professor Bradley for you. Um, he's the Bernadotte E. Schmidt Distinguished Service Professor of History at the University of Chicago and Faculty Director of the Posen Cent Family Center for Human Rights since 2021. Professor Bradley has served as editor of the American Historical Review and is an international historian of empire and the post-colonial in Asia and in the United States. Professor Bradley is the author of The World Reimagined, Americans and Human Rights in the 20th Century, which was published in 2016, uh, Vietnam at War, published in 2009, and Imagining Vietnam and America, the Making of Postcolonial Vietnam, uh, published in 2000, which won the Harry J. Benda Prize from the Association for Asian Studies. Uh, his current project is an intellectual and cultural history of the Global South, which we'll hear about tonight, which is supported by a fellowship from the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Mark Bradley. Thank you, Mark, for that really nice introduction. It is so nice to be back in Hong Kong, um, and particularly nice to be back at the University of Chicago Center in Hong Kong. So thank you for coming out. Those of you who are here and for the virtual audience, good to have you here too. What I want to do tonight is talk a little bit about my current research, um, which is an intellectual history of um, the rise of the global south. And to do that, I want to start with a story. Last fall, Ade Dharmawan, who's a member of the Jakarta-based artist collective Ruin Grupa, found himself addressing the German parliament. Ruin Grupa had been selected back in 2019 as the artistic directors for the 15th edition of Documenta. This is an exhibition that's held every five years in the German industrial town of Kassel. It has a budget of um, 50 million plus. It usually attracts more than half a million visitors over the hundred days of its various iterations. It is arguably, I think, one of the most important contemporary art exhibitions in the world. The news that Ruin Grupa had been selected to oversee the high profile documenta. Where are they? Whoops. There they are. Was big news in the art world for many reasons. They were the first Asian curators of the exhibition and the first artists, as opposed to museum professionals, to do so. Significantly, the selection of Ruin Grupa was only the second time that Documenta had been led by curators from the Global South. Since Documenta's founding in 1955, 13 of its 15 artistic directors were from either Western Europe or North America. But selecting Ruin Grupa was more than about demographics. Documenta's European-based organizing committee chooses its artistic directors, and they were worried that the whole kind of genre of these episodic international art exhibitions had become exhausted, and they were not alone. Although Documenta takes place once every five years, the more general moniker for these blockbuster international art shows, for those of you who don't follow the arts very closely, is the Biennale. Recurring exhibitions usually held every two years, sometimes every three, and like Documenta, every five. It's the Venice Biennale that perhaps for those of you who are a little bit familiar with this, that you'll think, yes, that's what a Biennale is. There had been an explosion of new Biennales in the 1990s and the early 2000s in Europe, but particularly in the Global South. 
And there was growing concern in the art world that the genre and the big spectacle that accompanies these biennales had become perhaps a bit tired and a bit predictable. In turning to Ruin Grupa, Documenta's organizers hoped that they would mix it up. And Ruin Grupa was more than happy to do that. I met members of the collective in Jakarta just before the pandemic came down in 2019, and they were full of ideas about how their documenta would be different. Biennales usually featured the work of individual artists, but instead Ruin Grupa decided to elevate the presence of artist collectives like themselves from around the global south. They wanted to foreground works and curate events that centered on what they termed, quote, today's injuries, especially ones rooted in colonialism, capitalism, or patriarchal structures. When Documenta 15's exhibition halls opened this past June, they were filled with topical collections of archival materials gathered and displayed by activist art collectives that address questions of environmental justice, climate change, gender, sexuality, and indigenous rights. There were also, as there often are at Biennales, installations that were scattered around the city of Kassel. Among them, an intentional anti-caste and anti-racist space called Party Office, organized by the, a Delhi-based collective. A Black futurist floating stage in the middle of the river that runs through Kassel was crafted by a Philadelphia art collective and a vegetable plot of migratory plants along with a self-described queer sauna were both organized by a Hanoi-based collective. To pull all these disparate strands together, Ruin Grippa borrowed from the Indonesian term for a communal rice barn, advancing what they called the principles of lumba, a concern with the collective, with sustainability, with equity, but particularly a desire for dialogue and conversation. Although altogether 67 artist collectives and as many as 1500 individual artists were invited to show and to talk about their work over the 100 days of Documenta. The day after Documenta opened, everything blew up. The Indonesian art collective Tarang Padang had installed a 60 foot outdoor banner, which you can see shrouded in black in this image. It was titled People's Justice and it featured cartoon-like depictions of activists who had opposed military rule in Indonesia during the 1990s. Among the several hundred Indonesian figures on the banner, there were two images that were quite troubling. One was a caricature of a Jew with side locks and fangs wearing a hat emblazoned with a Nazi SS emblem. The other was a military figure with a pig's head wearing a Star of David in a neckerchief that recalled a member of Mossad, that's Israeli security service. So there was a lot going on in this particular banner. And I'm hesitant to show you the banner itself or the images in question, but essentially what we had was a work of art about 1990s Indonesia by a self-styled progressive art collective displayed by another self-styled progressive art collective that drew on a variety of anti-Semitic tropes and imagery. German politicians and Jewish groups immediately denounced the banner as anti-Semitic. It was first wrapped in black, and that's what you see in this image here, and then removed altogether. And Tarn Paling and Ruin Grupa offered extended apologies. But the matter didn't end there. The German administrator of Documenta resigned under protest. A committee of experts was appointed to vet other work in the exhibition. And the German Minister of Culture, Claudia Roth, demanded an explanation for, quote, how clearly an anti-Semitic picture found itself in the exhibition in the first place. And so on the, on the 7th of September, 2020, Ade Dharma won, as a representative of only the second curatorial team from the Global South to lead one of the world's most important international art exhibitions, found himself in front of a very angry German parliament. Ade offered an assessment of what he said were the long histories that came together to put anti-Semitic images in the People's Justice banner, an assessment that fully recognized 
Karen Culling's culpability and the complicity of Ruin Grupa in its display. But he also told his German audience how he believed anti-Semitic imagery had traveled to Indonesia in the first place. Colonial violence in Dutch Indonesia, Ade said, had often pitted Indonesians against Chinese minorities, introducing um, what he termed originally European anti-Semitic ideas and images to portray the Chinese in ways in which some Europeans have portrayed Jews. In what he called a shocking and shameful way, this has come full circle in the artwork, transformed and appropriated in our own cultural context in an unacceptable way. He ended his remarks by insisting that the Global South is not something foreign to or different from the Global North. Instead, he argued, it is in their interconnected cosmologies that we can learn, share, and live together. The complexities of what went down in Kossel at Documenta 15 last year raise a set of larger issues that are central to my current research project, this inter uh, international um, history and intellectual history of the Global South. And indeed, the contestations at Documenta, I think, help us understand that the encounters between the South and the North today have a history. We can't understand the moment that we live in today without a deeper appreciation of the connected histories of the South and the North. Just as they did at Documenta, the long history of empire and the decolonial continue to hover over the present moment. But at the same time, as I will argue tonight, we need to be attentive to discontinuity and to rupture, to fully understand what it was that put Ruin Grupa and the Global South at the very center of global thought and culture in our present moment. I argue that something profound changed in the late 20th century. In that moment, I believe there was a fundamental transformation in the concepts and categories through which we understand the nature of being in the world, and that many of them first emerged in the Global South. Their origins and the ways in which they traveled are the subject of my book in progress, When the World Went South. The term, the Global South, has often been seen merely as a kind of descriptor, a handy cartographic imaginary after the passing of the Cold War and the Third World, or as a marker of persisting inequalities between North and South. I wanna ask a different series of questions about the making of the South and why it matters. First, how did we come to move from the era of the third world to that of the global South? What are the central elements that make up the often revolutionary ideals and practices of the South? And finally, how and why has the South come to shape the world that all of us live in today? When the world went south, focuses on the big ideas that made up this new Southern landscape and the remarkable set of people who brought them into being. To tell the stories of the way in which the global south is remaking the very meanings of politics, society, and culture in our times. I'd like to do several things in our time together this evening. First, I wanna give you a sense of where the larger project is going and what I think it means to write an intellectual history of the South that foregrounds historical rupture. And then I'd like to turn to two slightly deeper dives into the intellectual histories that I'm writing. Let me begin with the bigger picture. The climbing of the global South was rooted in a set of late 20th century upheavals in world order and global consciousness. The fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 signaled what one scholar has called the decomposition of the Cold War. And with it, the diminishing power of older ideas about state and society in what used to be called the third world. Beneath these more familiar moments of historical change were I think an even more sweeping set of ruptures in international structures and global consciousness that first emerged as early as the 1970s. In that decade, the intensification of global capitalism and neoliberal economic policies, shifting patterns of international migration, 
and the transnational diffusion of new technology and media began to reorder the relationship between sovereignty and state power. It unleashed a wave of globalization that would come to undergird the rise of the global south. The same period saw a shift in who had authority to make political and moral claims in the public sphere. Testimonial and moral witness became key words in this new era and brought the rise of new voices who centered demands for change in their own lived experience. They began to drive a new kind of politics and offer new forms of cultural expression. Quite simply, the late 20th century was the tipping point between the global order that had shaped the world since the Second World War, really, and the world that we live in today. It was in this hinge moment, just at the dawn of the 21st century, that the Global South first began to rise. The era of the Global South, in fact, opened a little bit earlier, as the late 1980s um, came with popular demands for democratic liberalization that produced new visions of political community from Beijing and Rangoon to Seoul and Johannesburg. In these popular movements for democracy, military authoritarianism, the apartheid state, and state socialism were all under attack. And with them, many of the political legacies of the era of the third world. To carve out a new space for civil society, a younger generation of political activists forged a very different relationship to the colonial past than their elders had who had governed the first post-colonial states. The commitment to collective self-determination and well-being that marked the moment of decolonization increasingly gave way to concerns with how individuals and their families could flourish in more or less democratic societies. The politics of the global south were also pushed forward by new social movements and southern intellectuals who put novel ideas about sustainability, resilience, heritage, and restorative justice on the global agenda for the first time. So a part of my book offers a history, a connected set of histories of the south in the making of these new political, economic, and social vocabularies. If Southern ideas were on the move, so too were Southern writers, filmmakers, musicians, and visual artists whose growing presence and influence began to remake global culture in the early 21st century. As late as the 1970s, really, the world of arts and letters had continued to operate pretty firmly in a Euro-American orbit. But the late 20th century brought an unparalleled run of Nobel Prizes in literature to Southern authors, a global English language Indian novel boom, the growing circulation of Chinese and Iranian cinema, along with Bollywood and Nollywood films, the rise of Afropop and world music, and the expanding presence of visual artists from the Global South, both in museums and biennales. In fact, global culture was becoming Southern culture. And in this, the visual arts were a critical site of experimentation and creativity as artists in the Global South began to embrace new modes of expression, such as installation and performance, to offer fresh perspectives on both communal and individual identities. Their work was disseminated through a massive expansion of museums and cultural infrastructure across both the South and the North. So, that's the kind of bigger picture that frames the project that I'm working on. And what I want to do now is touch down on two more granular examples of how the project is unfolding. How do you figure out change over time? It's a kind of classic methodological problem that all historians face as they do their work. And it's one that has been really central to my thinking about this project. Early in my research, I had a growing sense that I was going to write a story about change and rupture in the realm of ideas. But for me, the question was, how could I capture those changes in a compelling and persuasive way for readers? I thought about this a lot. And then I remembered the annual September ritual of the world leaders coming to the United Nations in New York to make an address before the General Assembly. Every September, they come 
The record of this now 70-year-old rhetorical practice might be one way, I thought, to capture the global zeitgeist at discrete moments in time and begin to uncover a kind of lexicon of the global South. So I've been doing a lot of reading and analyzing of September UN speeches, and the full text of these speeches can really be great to read. Now, you might not think, you know, it's like reading Tolstoy or novels, but you get a kind of sense, again, of time and place that's remarkable. These images are to kind of highlight third world time, global south time through two particular speeches. You'll recognize Fidel Castro as uh, the person at the image on the top. So Fidel Castro in 1960 comes to New York to give his September speech. It's the longest September speech that any world leader ever gives at the United Nations. It is 269 minutes of Castro standing before the General Assembly talking about a whole variety of things. It is Malaysian Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad who's underneath Castro in the slide. This is a speech given in September of 2018. Mahathir's speech was 10 minutes. It was over almost before it began. This was not uncommon in the era of the Global South, people moving through and giving fast speeches. Castro's speech in the era of the Third World was a bit on the long side, but on the other hand, people had a lot to say in that era, and the rhetorical practices were different in that era as well. So in a sense, both the form and content, as I look at these speeches back and forth, help to give a sense, I think, of time and of place. But, you know, there are a lot of these speeches. And so I've turned to methods in the digital humanities to try to go a little deeper in to what people are arguing. I've had the help here of talented undergraduate and doctoral students at the University of Chicago as research assistants. And we've built a corpus of more than 10,000 of these annual UN speeches. These are speeches from 1946 to 2000. And the idea was to try to map the key words that made up these two different eras, the era of the third world and the era of the global south, and to try to trace how conceptions of global politics shifted over this 70-year period of time. So we draw on machine learning and data visualization to, quote, read the entire corpus of these texts, and we do that with an eye towards surfacing frequency, emotional intensity, relational patterns in uh, the key words that emerge in them. And the changes really are quite dramatic. Um, speaking, I think, to the importance of thinking about rupture as we move into the era of the global south. What you see here is a taste of key words in these two eras. And I want to draw attention to three major ruptures around subjects, around issue areas, and most importantly, around conceptual frames of global political intervention. With subjects, what you see is a, glow, a growing plurality. Collectives in the form of the state or of the people were central to the era of the third world, and they don't go away in this era of the global south. But now individuals and their subjectivities, along with non-governmental organizations, have also become important uh, subjects in the new politics of the global south. The issues of concern that the world leaders are speaking about in these September speeches start to look different too as we move from one era to the other. Gender, the environment, climate, human rights, racism, sexuality, taking on unprecedented levels of attention and significance in the era of the global South. Oops. But as I say, finally and most importantly, from my perspective, it is the rise of new ontological categories at the turn of the millennium that fundamentally reordered how actors in the North and South thought about the political and the social. Among them, novel conceptions of justice, of sustainability, resilience, heritage, and capabilities. Now, I wanna give full credit to the digital humanities for sort of getting me to this place, but to unpack what these terms mean, I kind of have to go back to what historians more traditionally do, which is to do deep readings of text and to try to figure out how are these terms being mobilized, where do they come from, and how are they used? I want to give you just one example tonight, and that's a quick sense of 
this notion of capabilities. It's one of the key words that emerge in these speeches over and over and over again. It's ubiquitous in some of the vocabulary at the turn of the millennium around the global south. So I wanna get a sense of like, where did that come from? And what does it represent in terms of a shift in thinking about politics and the ways in which human beings interact in the world? Now, it was all quite simple, really, at least for those of you for whom statistics and mathematical formulas come easily. They don't come so easy for me, but for those that do, they look at this and they don't actually need the words on this side. They simply know what the formulas are telling them. In 1990, a team of social scientists from the Global South came to believe human development could be more precisely measured and compared by country. And this is how they did it. First, you calculate the deprivations a nation suffered around life expectancy, literacy, and income. So it's life expectancy, literacy, and income that are the three basic categories here. Next, you add those deprivations up. Finally, subtract that number from one. And like magic, the level of human development in a particular country pops out on the other side. Now, this formula was proposed by the Pakistani economist Mahbub al haq and the Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen. Sen is on the left, Haq is on the right in the image behind me. And their revolutionary projects sought to overturn what had up till that point been commonsensical notions about the sources of inequality and with it challenged the ways in which global economic development had been conceived over the last century. Increases in income, this is the way people have thought about it before. Increases in income, more precisely uh, gross national project, product or GNP, had been the dominant measures of development since the 1930s. But for Hawk and for Sen, access to income, they felt was a necessary but ultimately insufficient lens to understand the nature of human development. They saw, in other words, income as a means, not an end. Development, they argued, quote, should be more concerned with enhancing the lives we lead and the freedoms we enjoy in a continual process of enlarging people's choices. Hawkinson acknowledged that development required a decent standard of living, but at the same time insisted that the conditions that led to a long and healthy life, as they put it, and the ability to acquire knowledge, in their words, were just as important. In measuring the formation and cultivation of what they called essential capabilities, and this is where the word capabilities starts to be a kind of magic world of the word of this moment, Hawkinson began to reimagine how the determinants of economic and social progress worked. Quote, we need a measure. This is Hawk talking to Amartya Sen as they started the project. We need a measure, he said, of the same level of vulgarity as the GNP. These are his words, not mine. Just one number, but a measure that is not as blind to the social aspect of human lives as GNP is. In developing their indexical measures, Hawk, Sen, and their team wanted to get inside the processes of development and offer fundamentally new perspectives on what they believe to be its proper ends and means. Their human development project was based at the United Nations, which isn't generally thought of as a sort of hotbed of intellectual activity. But in their case, they were granted unusual independence and freedom in their work. And the project became over its lifespan of multiple decades, an innovative laboratory that pushed out a veritable caravan of new thinking about development. Over the course of the 1990s, Hawkinson annually produced a report on human development to accompany the statistics and measures that made up their index. Now they started with this really, really kind of tight index around life expectancy, education, and income. But over time, these widely influential reports were among the first to identify environmental sustainability and human rights as critical elements in the making of development policy. They also pioneered discussions of the relationship between gender and development, eventually producing additional indexes that plotted the empowerment of women. 
Most fundamentally, Hakan Sen put the South at the center of global conversations in the 1990s about the kinds of lives that people wanted to lead. Capabilities, again, the word capabilities was the key word at the core of all of their efforts. Sen often drew attention in his writings to Aristotle, who at the beginning of his ethics wrote, wealth is evidently not the good we are seeking, for it is merely useful and for the sake of something else. Hawkinson sought to understand what we can do with more wealth. For them, the answer was the expansion of the capabilities of individuals to, as they put it, lead the lives that they valued. It was not just in the worlds of political and social theory that Southern voices became visible and influential in the 1990s and the early 2000s. Southern culture increasingly transformed world culture over this period of time. And that shift, I think, emerged most dramatically in the realm of global visual culture. I wanna turn there now to give you a sense of how the visual played a central role in the creation of a new Southern facing global culture. Quote, one of the problematic aspects of visiting museums, art galleries, and other sites of cultural valuation in Europe and the United States, wrote the curator Okwi and Weezer in the fall of 1994, is quote, the persuasive absence, pervasive absence of art by contemporary African artists. He might have noticed a similar absence of contemporary artists from the Middle East and much of Asia as well. The Global South was largely invisible at the beginning of the 1990s in the international art world, reflecting decades, if not centuries long curatorial practices in works by Western masters dominated the walls of European and American museums and galleries. In the mid 20th century, and particularly after 1960, the work of some Japanese, Korean, and Latin American artists entered these collections, but they tended to be the exceptions that confirmed and Weiser's broader observation. The 1990s were a tipping point, and in the new millennium, visual artists from across the global South moved from the margin to the forefront of venerable Western cultural institutions, and over time would come to dominate a growing set of newly built museums and exhibition spaces in the global South itself. Hong Kong's M Plus is of course, one of the most important of these creations. And I just wanna say, Pauline, who's sitting here from M Plus today, she was kind enough to take me through M Plus on Tuesday. And it is, as you said, MoMA or Tate Modern in size and in ambition and is a remarkable institution to now have as a part of the non-Euro-American world. So M plus emblematic in a sense of how eventually these institutional changes have really, really broad resonance in the international art world. Now, like my examination of the intellectual histories of new textual vocabularies from the South, I'm exploring ways in which the visual was a central element in rethinking ways of being in the world that have emerged in the global South. And to flesh that out a bit, I want to offer a brief discussion of the career of uh, Anwiser, who you see behind me. He was a central figure in these remarkable transformations. When he first leveled his critique of European and American museums, he was a virtual unknown in global art circles. He was born in 1963 to a prosperous Ibu family in Southeast Nigeria. He lived through the massive disruptions of the Biafran War between 1967 and 1970 that forced his family to relocate more than 45 times. He decided to leave Nigeria when he was 18 years old and he moved to New York for college and supported himself as a waiter and a security guard. He also wrote experimental poetry and increasingly hung out in the village in New York with writers and musicians from the African diaspora. And Weezer couldn't help but notice that New York's major galleries almost never showed contemporary African art. And he began to look for curatorial opportunities in a museum environment that was slowly growing more sensitive to critiques about its Western bias. Within two years, Enwieser organized what was lauded as 
a landmark show of African photography at the Guggenheim Museum in New York. And from there, he went on to curate the Johannesburg Biennale in 1998, where just a few blocks away from the Biennale was the site of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was just beginning his work at the same moment. A year later, Anwieser was appointed the first artistic director from the Global South of Documenta. This is the big influential art exhibition that I opened my talk with. And it was Anwieser's Documenta 11 in 2002 that dramatically reduced traditional art world geographies by putting a new generation of contemporary visual artists from the Global South at the center of the exhibition. More than half of its 117 artists had ties to the Global South. And Weezer's ambition at Documenta 11 was to really create a global post-colonial spectacle. The artists he invited most often worked in the new canonical mediums of contemporary art, so in installation, in performance, in video. And in the grand Biennale style, and Weezer spread their work out over multiple venues to explore what he called, quote, the double moves of the post-colonial world under globalization. Many of the artists at Documenta 11 grappled with the meanings of everyday life in the Global South. Others were keen to explore the implications of the growing presence of former colonial subjects in still majority white Europe. And Weezer further extended the idea of Biennales as, as kind of mobile global platforms by organizing companion events in Delhi, in Lagos, in Berlin, and Vienna in the 18 months before Documenta opened in Kassel. They drew together academics, policymakers, and artists from the Global South for symposiums and sometimes smaller exhibitions to consider questions of transnational justice, contemporary urban social life, and the future of democracy. The exploration of transitional justice, for instance, involved writers, philosophers, historians, psychoanalysts, lawyers, and judges to talk about the growing spread of truth and reconciliation commissions modeled on the South African case. Documenta 11 was a transformative moment for global culture. It, quote, was indeed a revolution, wrote the celebrated Chilean-born artist Alfredo Jarre, who showed his work there. The art world, Jarre continued, was never the same. The exhibition solidified Anwieser's stature as one of the most important voices in the contemporary world of visual arts. And in its wake, he regularly ended up on lists of the most influential and powerful figures in the art world until his untimely death from cancer in 2017. But the transformation and the influence of Documenta went far deeper than Anwieser's own career trajectory that it solidified, in a sense, a major realignment in the making of cultural power. It punctuated, as one leading arts journal later claimed, the emergence of the South as a global cultural movement. And Weezer's Documenta was a harbinger of an even bigger wave that brought the work and ideas of artists from the global South to growing international audiences in our present moment. In writing these new Southern histories of global visual culture for my book, I trace a group of artists and curators from the Global South, many of them from the Southeast Asian region, who were, to quote the name of one of the big blockbuster traveling exhibitions of the 1990s, On the Move. And as I do so, I want to explore the impact of their work and ideas as they traveled between and across Asia, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and the Americas. By way of a conclusion, I'd like to return to the anchoring image I use to frame this talk. Inke Shodabare's Girl on a Globe 2, which you see in back of me. I should say that Shodabare's work was in Anwieser's Documenta 11, though this particular piece was not. The work of the Nigerian-born and now London-based Shonabare is most distinctively marked by his use of brilliantly colored Dutch wax print cotton. This was a fabric inspired by Indonesian batiks, but it was machine-made in the Netherlands. 
The biggest market for this fabric, in fact, was not in Indonesia, where many Indonesians saw the mass-produced cloth by their former colonizers as inauthentic. But instead, it was consumers in West Africa, where in the 1960s, it became a new symbol of African independence and identity, and later, a symbol in the United States among Black Americans as a sign of African heritage and solidarity. Shonabare bought the cloth in outdoor markets around London and used it to drape the headless figures that formed um, much of his sculptural work. To an extent, if you look at Girl on a Globe, it confirms the importance of continuities in thinking about the global South. The epigons of the imperial and the third world are all present in Girl on a Globe, just as they are throughout the intellectual histories of the global South. In this piece, for example, the circularities of the synthetic Dutch wax fabric cannot be understood outside the conditions of high imperialism and the unequal structures of political economy that shaped everyday life in and after empire and the revolutionary politics of third world solidarity. So in a sense, the image speaks not to rupture, but to continuity. But I would also argue that it serves as a kind of visual talisman for a set of important ruptures and new vocabularies that are also central to the making of the global South at the close of the 20th century. Let's start with the globe that the girl is somewhat precariously standing upon. The surface of the globe is shaded with colors that indicate zones of warming, indicators of climate and environmental change. And Shonabare based the color shading on an infrared heat map of the world that indicates the regions of the world that are most impacted by climate change, at least at the moment that he was doing the piece. And notably in this piece, it is nations in the global south. Now, to step back and extrapolate just a bit, in these dimensions of Girl on a Globe, we get a sense of the environment as an important conceptual category, a visceral sense of climate change, and a hint perhaps of the perils of ignoring ideas about sustainability. The environment, climate, sustainability, all key words that I think took shape and form in the Global South at the end of the late 20th century. Finally, what about the headless body of the girl? Because you might parse that in a number of ways. The headless figure could most readily seem in certain ways to convey an erasure of identity. But I wanna go in an opposite direction to suggest the absence of the head puts the focus on the body itself. Politics with a capital P, political economies, social life, even environmental change are refracted through the lens of the individual body. The individual, the body, its life conditions and its capabilities were among the critical markers of what it meant to rethink states of being in the global South. The turn to the global South, I believe has brought a really sweeping transformation in the subjects, the objects, and the conceptual frames that mark global political, economic, and social life in the early 21st centuries in the South and in the global North. Whether it be a UN speech by a world leader, the construction of the Human Development Index, Okwi and Weiser and Ruin Grupa's Documenta, or a work by Yone Shokabare, excuse me, Shonabare. These are the places where the rise, the circulation and impact of new ways of being were made at the turn of the millennium. Together, they create the conditions of possibility that shape the power of the imaginary that today we call the global South. We have some time for some questions, Mark. We do. We, do. we start in the uh, in the room here. Any questions in the room? Otherwise, we we do have some that came in online. Anybody want to get started? I don't, it's not so much a question. I I guess yeah. Thank you. Really enjoyed the 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 talk. 
I guess I'm just sort of, yeah, still absorbing everything that you you shared. Um, maybe what I would comment on is um, some, or yeah, a little bit of a question is to bring in or to maybe return to something that, that, that you touched on just a little bit in the UN speeches, mm -hmm. um, which is the bandung and the non-aligned um, So, I mean, I guess I'm curious to sort of understand or hear you say a little bit more about that particular movement. I mean, maybe because it came to my mind immediately as you were starting the talk, um, your talk about um, Documenta and, and Ron Rupa and Indonesia and and then, you're, yeah, it's just sort of this, this sort of connection point that I was sort of wondering if that was something in your mind that made that connection or or, or not, or how you situate that particular movement. There's been kind of a more recently an interest in rekindling yeah. these ideas. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I'm curious to hear how you think about that, like why people would be returning to, to that now or more recent, recently. Yeah, you know, um, Bandung has gotten more attention sort of since the Cold War was over, at least in a kind of broader discourse almost than it did kind of in the moment of becoming, right? And it is really interesting, I think, that people have come back and returned to Bandung. Bandung, or the Bandung spirit is often the way people think about it, was directly or indirectly, really important, I think, in giving people a sense of kind of what the third world was about, right? And some of that was about the ways in which, in a Cold War world, people could think about solidarities that crossed what we would now say South-South, right, rather than East-West. And so, in a certain sense, it was foundational in that way. Bandung also was about a particular moment in time the post-colonial moment where people were thinking about establishing states for the first time. And so when I was giving you a sense about changing vocabularies over this period of time, collectivities and the people and self-determination, that's what fills the speeches of the late 40s and 1950s and even into the early 1960s. Because colonization or decolonization, in a sense, isn't over in a formal kind of way until the early 1970s when Portugal finally lets go of its colonies, right? So it's a long, gradual process. That way of making meaning of what's happening in that part of the world has a long and deep history over that period of time. But then the post-colonial state is a thing. And the post-colonial state gets complicated. Right, And it gets complicated inside states, it gets complicated between states. And that's where it seems to me that in this political language at the UN, you start to see people talking about things in different kinds of ways. And also who can talk shifts a bit as well, right? Um, at the UN, it's still the world leaders, so you don't see that shift all that much. But the world leaders themselves are having to talk about social movements. The world leaders themselves are having to talk about NGOs. They're having to talk you know, in a vocabulary that's new and different from this earlier kind of bandum period. And also this notion about thinking about individuals and thinking about families isn't that people didn't think about individuals and families in an earlier period, but the emphasis and the interest in what that means seems to me somewhat different. So there's, I think a conceptual shift between the two, but I think the thing now that becomes so powerful, and you see it with a lot of contemporary artists going back and trying to think about Bandung in a whole variety of ways, mm -hmm. I think it's the solidarity and thinking in South-South lines, right? And taking that South-South talk and moving that into a new period, a new period when the East-West is gone, right? And so what are the valences by which people can think about being in the world? South-South even has more urgency in a certain kind of way, post-89, that it did in an earlier era. And it's not tied into a Cold War international order. And so what it is can be, in a sense, freer than it was in an earlier period. But people looking back, in a sense, for genealogies to sort of use that language 
to create a sense of that language being used over time, but I think deployed in really new and fundamentally interesting ways in, in the later period. So the whole project like hovers between continuity and change, like all historical work, right? Where, where do you put the thumb, right? Is it more that their continuity is moving forward or is it more that there's change? I think they're really important continuities. I mean, the decolonial, isn't over, the post-colonial isn't over, the kind of structures of inequality that were part of the moment of imperialism and the early independence period, they're all there. But I also wanna say that something happened after, um, after 89 that wasn't totally dependent on 89. It was things were changing even in the 1970s in the ways in which people were thinking about the world around them and that that's just as important to capture as well. So it's trying to think, about how you balance both of those back and forth. I kind of overemphasize the rupture side of it because I think that's the side that gets less attention. I think the continuities kind of sit there more for people. In the book itself, I got to calibrate back and forth. I mean, there are interesting parallels we can make with the whole, the rise of the biennial, the rise of global south and the rise of the biennial as a model, as a trope, as a thing that in which artists were you know, selected from countries and nations for specific reasons and representing their country yeah. and nation in particular contexts and, and so on. So it's, yeah, it extends, it's a par there's interesting parallels that you can, can make there from what you've said that if you look at that in, within the context of the um, exhibition making, art, art uh, biennial making and existence of biennial, which does start with Venice, but of course, right. still the mothership, but then um, the other, other biennials mirroring some of that. Yeah, and, and watching, you know, kind of how curators are struggling from the late 80s into the 2000s about letting go of the nation as the frame in thinking about artist selection and moving toward a set of thematics that crosses in, in one form or another. There's a, um, it's a triennale, not a biennale. These terms get all kind of complicated that starts in Australia and Brisbane um, in the early 1980s and has several iterations as it goes through. And it just happens to be, I'm gonna call it a Biennale because it's easier than you know doing the, the specialized language. It happens to be a Biennale where the records from the decisions the curators were made have been preserved in a lot of detail. And it's been one place that's been really interesting for me to just see people arguing back and forth in this moment. Nation, no, 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 not nation, theme. Well, what does it mean if it's theme, if it's ephemeral? And just, you know, again, the kind of intellectual vitality by which people were engaging with these questions about how to think about self-representation, collective representation. And again, I think that's really in play in really, really interesting ways um, in that moment. This might be a good follow-on question. Um, I didn't hear the labels, democracy, socialism, communism in your talk. Uh, maybe I missed them. But I'm wondering if those labels as political transcend are transcended by this concept of the global south. Well, you know, the era of state socialism certainly starts to pass post-89, although, you know, what a China or a Vietnam or a Cuba is in the 80s and 90s and even now is, you know, complicated, right? But the notion of sort of high socialism as not being operative in the ways it was before 1989. Um, democracy is all tangled up in this, but in, in also really complicated ways. So one of the images that I showed but didn't say very much about was of Aung San Suu Kyi. And Aung San Suu Kyi um, essentially leading a democracy movement in Burma in the late 1980s. And throughout the period of the 90s and really into the 2000s, she and other democracy advocates in other places of the world were essentially on a kind of pedestal, both within the global south and in the global north. Most of you know that the Aung San Suu Kyi story got super complicated as time went by. And um, her relationship to the regime, the Rohingya crisis, um, it, it, her story has moved in ways that would have been completely unpredictable to many people, I think, when she won the Nobel Peace Prize. And so I think the other thing about this period is that it opens with aspirations that often are not fulfilled as time goes by. And so people then 
particularly I think in the art world, self-reflectively thinking about what it means that those changes, again, haven't worked in, in, in the kind of moment um, of, of the late 1980s. I mean, I, um, <laughs> when you're gonna publish a book, you start talking to publishers about whether they'd like to publish your book. And I was talking to um, a publisher based in the UK that I'll let remain nameless. And they were reading the proposal that I wrote and they said, you know, Mark, yeah. Uh, 10 years ago, if Aksan Suchi had been in your book, we would have snapped it up. Everybody would have wanted to read about this, but she said, mm, not anymore. And it was just this kind of notion that like, you know, again, for, I'm going to take this publisher and make them sort of writ large, right? In sort of still the kind of Euro-American world of publishing and arts and letters. There was only one kind of almost one dimensional way to think about political figures in the region, right? So either, you know, you were a kind of saint and martyr, or you were, you know, somebody who suddenly was a sort of person non grata, but not that interested in understanding how, you know, she's always been the person that she is, right? And trying to figure out how that might be, what was embedded in a pro-democracy movement that was complicated from the very start. Um, again, I think like, <laughs> that's considerably different than the controversy that was surrounding Documenta at Kossel um, and Ruin Grupa. But when the South comes North, it's still a complicated set of interactions about how to have conversations about a whole set of things, right? Um, it was hard for this person to have a conversation about Aung San Suu Kyi that seemed to me like a three-dimensional one. It was hard in Germany for people to have a conversation again about the complexities of what it meant to have a variety of viewpoints and imagery that some people found incredibly distasteful um, and, and how one would think that sort of thing through. Question from online. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the lecture. So you sort of mentioned Sen and the idea of capabilities. Mm -hmm. In Sen's book, Development is Freedom, he mentions capabilities as a means and as an end. My question is, how does sort of the newfound notion of cultural relativism uh, tie into that? Because for Sen, it was inherently universal, these capabilities were universal. But in more and more we see in the global south, there are countries which say, no, we have a different conception and that should be respected. Yeah, I mean, I think the way Sen himself might try to argue around that problem is to say that states and peoples might have different ways of understanding what those capabilities are, the significance of them, and also in more instrumental ways, the means by which one starts to get to those. The, the way Human Development Index worked, and, and, and it, it really does go very close to, to what you've read from Sen, was around a pretty tight set of things. It's about life expectancy, it's about education and it's about income. And at that level, the cultural relatives argument is a little bit tougher, right? I mean, people live and they die. There's not a lot of cultural relativism around that. Now, what that means in people's lives is shaped in profound ways by culture, but just as a marker of something to put in the mix to think about, it seems that it has a universalistic um, element to it. Education arguably working in the same way Income was traditionally just the way people would, who would think through those questions. So I think for Sen, the means by which one got there would be different and ones that needed to be respected as you move from place to place. But I think he would stake the larger claim that cultural relativism still leaves to the side that these would be fundamental ways of thinking about societies. Now, the index gets more complicated over time. So issues of women's empowerment begins to emerge, human rights begins to emerge, a set of sort of sustainability and um, environmental variables begin to emerge. There, one can imagine a cultural relativist argument and debate much stronger in a sense, right? About whether to measure those, whether that would be in the mix in one form or another. But the three basic building blocks of it comes, you know, I think very close to what he wants to think about in universalistic terms. What if sort of 
I know you didn't cover this, uh, but obviously Martha Niesbaum, Professor Niesbaum, and her sort of more, um, I guess, I, I almost want to say liberal approach with the capability theor theories. How would that tie in? Especially as Sen Senstein was moving from third world to global south, he published his final like development of freedom in 97. Yep. She was later. Yeah. Well, they were close interlocutors and they're thinking back and forth about this, right? So, um, you know, so Martha Nussbaum, for people who don't know it, who is one of my colleagues at the University of Chicago, Martha's a philosopher, um, but Martha's also in, she's in law, she's in philosophy, she's in classics. Martha has a, a, a huge range in what she does. And Martha's taken this over a longer period of time to now be thinking fundamentally about human animal relations, right? And thinking about what this means in that context. So she's moved in directions that are very different than this sort of 90s moment, right? And I think the other thing about this moment was it's the interaction between a kind of economic philosopher like Sen and somebody like Al Haq, who really isn't so philosophically inclined, but a very kind of practical political person who is an economist, right? They're both trained at Cambridge at the same time. They're both um, getting the kind of gospel of developmental economics in the 1950s. They're essentially, that's the way they see the world. And they both have this kind of declension moment, right? For why that's so. Sen's declension moment is a more intellectual one, I think. For Al Haq, it's he's running economic development in Pakistan and begins to think that the emperor being him has no clothes in a sense, and that something has gone wrong in one fundamental way or another. And they somehow from policy world and the intellectual world come together. And it's their interaction that I think is really kind of interesting in this moment, right? That, that the world of social theory that Sen inhabits suddenly starts to have a really major policy dimension that I'm sure Sen was often a little bit uncomfortable about, right? Because if you're thinking about social theory and you're thinking about kind of the nitty gritty of policy on the ground, there's often, you know, a separation of the difference. It, I'm glad to hear that people are still reading his work though. Yeah, Development as Freedom is a great, is a great book. Maybe one online question. Yeah. Um, uh, somebody is asking, which country or region in the Global South accounts for the highest influence from a visual arts perspective? Is there one? See, I should turn this back on the M plus <laughs> people who are in the room. Um, <laughs> One way of thinking about the question is who, for whatever reason, started to kind of emerge first in your American exhibitionary um, the world, right? And in Asia, at least, um, it tends to be contemporary Chinese artists, you know, from the 1980s and the 1990s who in some ways are the first that, again, emerge as important for Western curators. Um, they're not my focus. My focus, um, at least the case study that I do in the book is, is around Southeast Asia. And so I haven't thought so much about, you know, who's there first, or in some ways, it, it's very difficult to measure influence in a sense. But what I'm interested in is like, how do people go from a relatively closed world during what you would say is kind of Cold War and Third World time, right? Like it was hard to move. People were siloed in very, very fundamental ways. And one of the incredibly striking things to me in Southeast Asia, and Southeast Asia is nice because you've got multiple societies and cultures and states operating at the same time, right? But that in all these places, you see similar kinds of turns, right? So the turn to installation, the turn to performance, the turn to thinking in, I think around subjectivities, again, rather than collectives, it, it happens you know, in a variety of spaces simultaneously. And I, if I had more time, I could talk about where there's some connections, but it's remarkable how few connections there actually are early on. And this, um, this uh, triennale in Australia that I was talking about earlier 
one of the um, artists, Harry Dono, an in Indonesian artist that I've been working some with in this project, he said, you know, we went to Brisbane of all places and we met each other. And I realized that there was somebody in Bangkok who was thinking about the world in the way in which I'm thinking about the world. Or there was somebody in Singapore, but it that that kind of like people just are on the move sort of thing, that had not been the way in which people's kind of intellectual world was structured in that period of time. So there really is something about movement post-1989 that begins to, I think, really influence a whole variety of people. So in that sense, like where it happens first, I'm not sure that that matters as much as the fact that people are moving around and they're talking and influencing each other in, in all kinds of ways, and then beginning to exhibit together in ways that they had never done before either. Is it appropriate to, um, to, to think that in the United States, for example, in certain segments of society in the United States, the global South can exist? in a society, in a culture, in an economy like, like the US? Yeah, I mean, I think that in the United States, sometimes um, Black Americans and Native Americans make explicit arguments that in a sense, part of their lives has been in a kind of global South, in the global North, that they identify in South-South solidarity terms across in certain kinds of ways. Um, some of that, I mean, the kind of like African, Black, American solidarities, you know, went on during the Cold War period too. So that's not new in a sense. It has maybe a new kind of inflection now. One of the most interesting places you see it though is with Indigenous artists right now. And the sense that Indigenous artists seeing, beginning to kind of see themselves other places, right? Which had not really been so much the case in the way in which um, indigenous politics had worked. There was, you know, there's a certain amount of UN um, political work that goes on around um, indigenous peoples. But again, the notion of like seeing that in a palpable way as an American, Native American, thinking about First Nations, you know, in Australia or Canada, that that too seems to be about opening up flows in one form or another. And LGBTQ type communities as well around, around the globe, could they also be sort of classified? Well, it, I, that's an interesting question. Like I've never explicitly heard, at least in an American context, L LGBTQ communities talking about the global south but certainly in talking about solidarities across space but not necessarily that could be north north it could be south north it could be a variety of things and that gets a little bit fraught too because lgbt communities lgbtq communities in the global south often aren't necessarily pleased to be instructed by Northerners in the ways in which they might think about their politics, right? So, um, you know, the, the, the thing about solidarities is there's solidarities and then underneath the solidarities, there are tensions. And those tensions are interesting to uncover and unpack too, because they're also revealing of a whole variety of power dynamics that can get submerged in, in other kinds of uh, ways. Thank you so much for the lecture. Yeah, thanks. I'll close us out tonight. Um, I am fascinated by that topic and I hope we can hear more about it from, from you, um, Professor Bradley and from other uh, faculty at UChicago. Yeah, I think it's just a fascinating area for us to be exploring and learning more about. Um, I'd like to close out the program for our online and in-person audience uh, by talking about uh, some upcoming programs. Next program we have is July 6th. Uh, this will be a virtual program. Uh, and we'll be focusing on ChatGPT's influence on investment and decision making. So I'm sure a lot of people will be really, really interested in, uh, in that program. Uh, we'll be featuring uh, one of our UChicago faculty along with um, one of the local faculty from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, as well as a practitioner from uh, uh, HSBC out of London. So that's one program. And uh, the next one is um, one we're calling Billionaire Secrets, Bias in the Luxury Real Estate Market. So we'll be featuring our first billionaire 
uh, with one of our faculty, uh, Matthew Jesse Jackson. Um, please come to that. We'll be talking about a lot of the bias, sexual bias and wealth inequality bias in the luxury real estate market, particularly focused on New York, but also in other uh, parts of um, the world as luxury real estate continues to be developed and um, available to the very, very rich. Uh, and then finally, I just wanted to tell everybody about our podcast, which uh, we're celebrating the 100th episode of the podcast called The Course, uh, which we only started last year. So it's been less than a full academic year for us, which closes out at the end of this month in just a few days. Um, this was an idea from one of our staff members um, uh, who came to me and uh, said that she would like to inspire young people uh, to become faculty uh, by telling faculty stories. So um, we've interviewed 100 uh, faculty and we'll continue interviewing our faculty about how they became professors. And you know, we focus on uh, individuals who come from less advantaged backgrounds, immigrant backgrounds. Uh, so really not your uh, you know, two professor uh, parent uh, home or, or wealthy backgrounds per se, but people who really had to struggle to get where they're at because they had a passion for doing what they do. So um, I haven't listened to all 100 myself, but I've listened to many. And uh, I encourage you to start with number one and work your way through uh, and look for areas. Uh, it features faculty from all across the University of Chicago uh, in almost every discipline. So we're really excited about this, uh, this podcast and hope you will be too. So with that, I'll close out the program. Thank you for everybody who joined online. And for those of you who joined in person, uh, Professor Bradley will probably answer a few more of your questions here uh, in person. Thank you so much for joining tonight.